Welcome to River Foursquare, where we meet in community together to learn more about Jesus, to grow in Him, and to be discipled together. Because following Jesus requires other people. You can't do it by yourself. Can't Discipleship you happens in community. So you can learn more about how we do church at riverfoursquare.org and click on that connect tab. We have all community gatherings where everyone from the local Seattle area comes together for worship and prayer and communion uh, once a month. The next one is October 21st at 6 p.m. So come out and join us for that. If you're part of one of our local communities, it is October. That means it is time to start bringing in candy and ask your community leaders what you can do to help for our outreach event and Halloween. Uh, your each community is doing their own thing, so talk to your community leader about what they need and how to be a part of that. And finally, if you're part of River, thank you so much for continuing to give. Uh, your giving allows us to meet with you via this video and also to do the things that we do in our community. So um, you can do that at riverfoursquare.org or you can click uh, text to 84321. Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for your presence being here. Be your teacher, Holy Spirit. Be the one who leads us in truth as we open up scriptures, as we uh, finish up John chapter 7 today. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we talked about that we're in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Just like Jesus was in partnership with the Holy Spirit working together, we're in partnership. That Jesus had pointed out there is if our wills do God's will, then we'll know what his will is. We'll see it because our intentions do God's will. Of course, you'll see his will. And we do that because we're in partnership. We're working with the Holy Spirit. As Paul prayed, he goes, I want you to be in partnership with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit works through us and in us. And by that, we are being led. That's how we're led. We're led because the Holy Spirit's working through us and in us. And the Holy Spirit is not a bully. He leads. He points out. He leads us. And he leads us into what he is doing. This is what I'm doing. Go this way. Go this direction. And we get to participate in that because of that leading. Because we choose to follow. Because we, our desires to do God's will, we get to participate in God's will. So here's a question for our community. Pastor Rosanne, yeah. we ask, because you use a word here we've never used. A word that we've not used. Never All right. ever used. So what is one thing that stuck to you in your time with Jesus this week or your devotions? Never use that word. It's a, it's a word that the church sometimes uses to talk about your time with Jesus when you take time to read your Bible and pray and talk your to God, time. your connection time with God. Uh, what was something that stood out to you as you were doing that this week? Uh, what did Jesus say to you? How did he encourage you? What scripture passages are you reading right now? What are the things that God's leading you into? How are you spending time with him? What is something that you got out of your time connecting with Jesus, your devotion time with him this week?
So many of my childhood memories involve water. Maybe because I grew up in Southern California, I'm not sure. Or they're just water, I'm not sure. But so many inv involve water, whether it be water balloon fights. Um, before they had the water balloon grenades, like we had the old school water balloons. We had, before they even made the plastic hose attachments, there was metal, like real hose attachments that were our favorites to fill up water balloons. There was, there was, a, there was a difference. And you know, you always go to the one house that's like, they had the good hose uh, nozzle hose part. Hose nozzles, yeah. were like those are water balloon ones. We didn't have these fancy ones that cut off. Or that now you don't even have to have a fancy nozzle. You just screw it on into the thing and you go shake it and all the water balloons come off. And you feel like 60 balloons at the like same 60 time. And like, like and like one, less than one, really. And you don't have, you have to tie, tie them. Because you'd always get these little, uh, you'd always, uh, was it rip up a piece of your skin? Because you, you oh, were yeah. digging it under. You'd yeah. rip up. And then I'd always have like a little piece. Of, I'm surprised I don't have scar tissue right there from just so, so many water balloons. And, and you know, this water gun, there's always a, a battle of supremacy of the water gun. Because this is pre-super soaker and so just imagine just go to your local store and get the little you know squirt, single trigger yeah squirt how squirt, inferior squirt, those squirt, are because you can only imagine what a super soaker did it was a game changer it changed the the it changed the warfare on the battlefield it changed it absolutely changed it. i still have one of my <clears throat> uh, older super soakers one of the best ones ever made so it's an xp 150 oh my goodness things i can it Things that can is such a good gun, such a good gun. Anyway, slip and slides, you know, and this is before, actually there were slip and slides, but nobody bought those. You'd, you'd go to the guy who had the big giant uh, sheet of plastic, the giant sheet of Visqueen, mm -hmm. and you put in the thing, and one of my friends, he had a sloped yard, mm -hmm. so we'd go down the hill, and then we use picnic, uh, picnic benches to make a pool at the end. Like, we were rocking the pool before they even have the splash the bonsai pool. splash pool yeah, giant like blow we, up like we were doing a whale before then we had the we had the whole thing so much water <laughs> so so much water water is important and jesus here in john chapter 7 the last part of it he goes at the last day of this feast this feast of booths which we'll talk more about here in a second but the last day of the feast of booths he makes a statement about water it's a really important statement. And after Jesus makes a statement, everybody kind of looks at each other and goes, did he just say what I thought he said? No, oh, no, he didn't. Oh, what? And it, it's, it's super, super important. So let's look at this in John chapter 7, verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And when they heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisee, who said to them, Why do you not bring him? And the officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, and who was one of them, said to him, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? And they replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Okay. So this is the last day of the Feast of Booths, where, remember, uh, it's a feast in Israel that happens September, October, that you would go and you'd make a temporary structure of tree branches, willow boughs. Um, you'd make a, a cool fort. Mm -hmm. And you would live in it for a week to, to honor and to celebrate and to remember the fact that your people, the Israelites, when they left Egypt, lived in temporary structures for 40 years. And so you would do this for an entire week. So last week was the middle of the week. Now it's the last day. So it's either day seven or day eight, depending on how you count it. So it's the last day of, of this festival, and everything comes to a giant a culmination where there's usually a big proclamation at the end of the deal. It's a big deal. The last day is an important day. Now, every single day of this feast, starting with day one all the way to the last feast, the priests would take a, they had this golden jar 
urn, right? <laughs> a golden urn. And they would take it and to, they would dip up a scoop of water from the pool of Siloam. Where is it? It's about a half a mile away from the temple. So they would dip it up and then they would walk it down the street. And as they do this, it was a big deal because it was a feast of food. It was a, it was a, it was a festive atmosphere. And so this long procession would form. And, and when it finally came to the temple area, there would be uh, trumpets and sound. And they would take the water and they would pour it onto the altar. Now, <laughs> why do they do this? Well, there's three reasons they would do this. Number one, it was to remind the people that God gave the Israelites water in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. You know, water from the rock, Moses striking it. He says, remember, remember this whole thing is remembering this exile, this wilderness journey. So, of course, he would do this water thing. It's just, mind you, God gave you water. Mm -hmm. The second thing was, remember, it's the end of September, October. Israel is on the same latitude I get that right? Latitude, la longitude is this way. Latitude is this way. Pneumatic device. And so they're at the same latitude. It's roughly Los Angeles, Southern California. So similar, similar weather patterns, if you will. Though Israel gets a little bit colder, but similar weather patterns. So September, October, it's the end of a long, hot, dry summer. Where there's, it doesn't rain in the summer in California. It just doesn't rain. So it's the end of that. So this, this procession jumping out is a prayer for rain. God, you're the one who gives rain. We're getting, going into the rainy season, a.k.a. fall and winter. The third reason why they do this is it's a prophetic statement. Big words. A prophetic statement is a, a prophetic means uh, declaring what God is intending to do. So it makes this prophetic statement that God is going to give his Holy Spirit as he's been telling us for thousands of years through his prophets mm -hmm. that God is actually going to give us his spirit. And so it's a prophetic act. Now, so last day of the feast, Jesus is sitting down. I think that's important. He's sitting, he's sitting, he's sitting down, he's talking, he's teaching a group of people. We know how big the group was, it doesn't say, but there, obviously there's more than one. Obviously, the disciples were there, and he's teaching. And they had probably just come in and probably had just poured out this pitcher of water. Whenever Jesus uses an analogy, there's a probably a good shot that whatever he uses, he, there's something right next to it. So, for instance, when Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, he's standing in a vineyard, mm -hmm. right? So Jesus is looking around. He goes, look at this. See these? Um, when Jesus talks about the lilies of the field, he was there might have been lilies right by him. Mm -hmm. This, this makes sense. So it was probably right after they had just poured out the pitcher of water. And it says, Jesus stands up. He kind of like, stop what you're doing. He stands up and he says, he cries. He makes this bold proclamation so everybody could hear him there. Remember, there's a procession. There's, there's trumpets. There's all this stuff going in. There's all this hoop off for the last day where they're pouring out this pitcher of water onto the altar. Jesus stands up, makes this bold proclamation in verse 37. He says this, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, just as the scripture says, out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. And everybody there understands exactly what Jesus had just said. Even the Apostle John, in writing this, it's funny, John writes things, and sometimes he adds commentary. He goes, he goes Jesus said this and this and this. And then it was like, you'll see a little hand. He goes, and by Jesus saying this, he meant this. Jesus, John actually adds his own commentary to what Jesus says. Like, it was, a mis it, was, it was a mystery. He goes, I don't want you to be confused. Let me tell you what actually Jesus meant. And so G John adds commentary. And he goes, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Everybody there knows exactly what Jesus is talking about. That Jesus just said that the Holy Spirit is going to come through him. And so everybody looks at each other and goes, is this the Messiah? Because the Messiah was the one who was supposed to say, like, is this the Messiah? And there was more like, it wasn't necessarily a moment of outrage, but it, it was one of, did I just hear what I heard? Did I just hear what he heard? And then there's this consternation that rises within the Jewish religious leaders, and they're like, well, no prophets ever come out of Galilee. That's crazy. Well, rumor, or spoiler, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, um, where he was supposed to come from. But surely, there's, and there's this great moment. Did we just hear what we just heard. So something for us to talk about in our communities is uh, 
Look at that passage. What's the interesting part about that? Um, I think sometimes it's important when you read scripture, you understand context, which is the, the background story, which is like when they mention you know, feasts and, and these things where, where the scripture says this feast is going on, it's important to know what that feast is because you understand contextually the p- image and the picture. So what stands out from you from this passage? That what Jesus did, what was going on, what, what, what's all there? Let's talk about it. Water is life. We need it, right? We need this. We need this this clear, tasteless substance that matters so much. Hopefully it's clear. And as I was expressing before, there's so many memories. Most, a lot of my childhood involved water, whether it be going to the community pool, the independence pool, we're not calling it by its new name, right? <laughs> 
I'm bitter. Um, whether it be water balloon fights, whether it be just a cold glass of water on a hot day. Though we never drink out of glasses, we drink out of little plastic tumblers. Did you have the Kool-Aid ones? I had the Kool-Aid ones. No, I had the video game ones from 7-Eleven. Um, I just totally dated myself. You did. Somebody has just had a, a moment. Some people are like going on eBay right now and checking what they are and cost. <laughs> yeah, we had the video game ones from 7-Eleven. It was a thing. You buy Slurpees, you got a free tumbler. The things they do to manipulate us to buy products. Anyway, and, and we, we drink it because we need it. We, we need water. I remember also as, as a kid going on these crazy bike rides, like summer, man, we were just on our bikes from sunup to sundown, didn't make, actually past sundown, didn't make a difference. We were on our bikes. We'd go 20 mile rides and it was just normal. We, we'd do 20 miles. And, and I know this because now as an adult, I go to Google Maps and actually I, I, I map it and it goes, how far was that? I'm like, holy cow, that was far. I had no idea I was riding my bike that far. And so these 20 mile bike rides, and we didn't have these water bottles. Like everyone's soft, like y'all are soft, right? We have these, I have my water bottle. I have my clean canteen or my... Hydro flask. Hydro flask. Or your like Yeti. Or, or my Yeti, we, we're, you're, you're all soft, right? We're all soft, right? We didn't have these water bottles. You went on your ride, you went about your day, you didn't have water. And when you're out on your bike ride, you might fight in a drinking fountain at a park, that worked. Yeah, we might find a drinking fountain that actually worked, maybe, or, and then, but as soon as you got home, man, you needed water. And so oftentimes the hose, hose right there in front of the house, that was the first thing. And the great thing about the hose water, hose is, man, you could just dunk your head because you're sweaty. We didn't have helmets back then either. We didn't do that. We are all soft, right? We, <laughs> you know, we did it to, to cool, to cool off because we're so thirsty. Our so our throat was dry. The temperature was hot. We poured it over, over our heads. We were desperate for water. Jesus stands up at this and he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. If anyone has been on a hot ride, let him come to me. If anyone is worn out, let them come to me. If this season of life is hard, let them come to me. If you're dry and you need to be refueled, let them come to me. If you've been running miles and miles and miles and there was no refill stations, let them come to me. Jesus makes a statement. He goes, I'm, 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 the Holy Spirit's coming. And if whatever you need, come to me. If you're thirsty, come to me and you will be filled. Mm -hmm. Question. So you can either answer this one of two ways. It's a multiple choice. You can answer it as physically or you can answer it as spiritually. But have you share a time when you've been really thirsty and what you did to quench your thirst. Whether that's a physical time that you remember just being like, I needed a drink. And what was it that you like, up a barrel that, cactus. that helped you? Um, or if you like are re just really resonating with what Andrew just said about being spiritually thirsty and you had an encounter with God that changed that for you. Um, talk about that. Either one. Choose one.
If anyone is thirsty, come to me. So what is this thirst? What is this verse? What is this spiritual, emotional, mental condition of thirst? Mm -hmm. Think about how to describe this. It's a, <laughs> it's a, a void and an emptiness and a longing for something more from him. It's a place where you know Jesus calling you into something else, knowing that your current state is not Zoe life. It's not the life the way God intended for you to live. It's knowing that and being unsatisfied with that. And there's a thirst. There's a thirst. And there's times in physically and spiritually when we're thirsty. And there's other times when we're really thirsty. There's times there, there's, there's a different, there's, a, there's a, a daily need where we just need to be connected to him, to know that he it, is there. Because we weren't made to be separated from him. We weren't made to be disconnected from him at all, mm -hmm. at all. We were always supposed to be connected to him. Now, sin came in, you guys know this, sin came, came in and separates us, severs that connection with him. Our choices of our disobedience to God separates us from that. And not only that, but it breaks us. It breaks how we're supposed to work. Let's think of a car for a second. Um, those of you who've had a flat tire, or at least seen from flat tires, you can drive on a flat tire, right? It's not the end of the world. You can drive on a flat tire. Um, it's always funny when people have flat tires, they immediately stop on the freeway. I was like, just pull it aside. Just pull. It's okay. It's all right. Right? You can drive on a flat tire. But if you drive on a flat tire long enough, you'll do what? You'll bend your rim. Rims cost more than tires. Let's just face it. Right? Tires are expensive. Rims are more expensive. But you can drive on a flat tire. So if you keep driving on your flat tire, okay, well, your tire's going to eventually going to fall off, and you're going to start riding on your rim, and you're going to bend your rim. You can drive on a rim. I see all these videos, crazy videos on YouTube with third-world occasions. They're driving around on rims. And I was like, that kind of, kind of looks fun. And the reason why is because when you drive on a rim, you lose traction. You can't steer well. You lose your stopping power. You can't brake appropriately. But you can drive on a rim. You'll break the rim. And you lose steering. And you lose braking. But you can drive on a rim. And if you drive on a rim long enough, right? You can continue to do this. It starts to affect your suspension. You'll lose your shocks. It'll break it. And you can drive on a bent rim, a grinded up rim at this point. Bad suspension. You can do that. You can do that. You can drive for that. It's a ton of work because that car is constantly pulling that direction. It's constantly fighting you. And if you keep driving on that long enough, what you'll do is you'll start breaking your suspension arms. You start breaking your CV joints, which is kind of the, the axle thing that goes in there. You start breaking that. And eventually what will happen is you'll start damaging the frame because all that energy, the bounces from the road, will, will disperse back up into the car, and you'll start damaging your frame. But you can totally do it. And eventually, if you damage the frame long enough, well, you're not going to drive anymore. That's sin. You can work about sin. You can live with sin, but it breaks you. You're driving on a flat tire. You're driving on, on a bent rim. Now, with that, we can come in and, and ask God to receive forgiveness. We can confess those wrongs, and he will forgive us. And when we receive it, we're restored, and that connection is, is brought back up. But if we don't have connection with him, it affects us, just like the flat tire. It affects us. It shows up in our attitude. It shows up in our reactions to things mm -hmm. and how we treat people. It shows up in our view of life. We can even go into, like, the fruit of the Spirit, as it mentions in Philippians or uh, Ephesians, chapter 5, right? Yeah, chapter 5. Galatians. I think that's right. If not, just, just yell at the screen like I'm wrong. Galatians. 
you would think we know what we're doing. Okay. The fruit of the this spirit. Galatians chapter five, six and seven, I think. I think you may be right. Yeah. Of which there are, is no law. So <laughs> yes, it's actually anyway, it's thinking of the armor. Right? But these are the kinds of things that when that connection is severed, these are the kinds of things that go. Because our lives are to be viewed through God's viewpoint. Mm -hmm. How he sees things, through his actions, through his promises, through his declared intentions, through his zoe, I already defined it, so I'm not going to do it again, through his zoe, and those are found in connection to him. Are we thirsty for that? Yeah. Are we thirsty for that? So here's your next question. How is your connection with Jesus right now? Where are you at with your vehicle? If we would use that analogy that Andrew just used, are you running all four tires? Are they are they inflated? Are they strong? Are you moving along at a good clip because you're in connection, everything's working? Do you have a slow leak? Do you have a flat? Have you been running on your rims for a while? Is your car kind of like at the end point and it's collapsing and falling apart? Where are you in that spectrum of things? And how do you think you got there? If you want to talk about that, um, or what what can your community pray with you? Like, what can we do to support you if you if you've got that flat tire? You've got those other things. Um, what are some things that you're pondering about what you could do to reconnect?
So we talked about being thirsty. Let's talk about being really thirsty, really thirsty. What that is, is it's been a long time since you've had a deep, meaningful connection with him. And maybe that's led to a, a frustration because of the lack of connection. And that the, from the depth, I'm going to use weird words here, from the depth of your soul, you're needing something from him. You need something from him. You need some hope. You need some answers from Jesus. And, and here's the thing. It doesn't matter what state you're in. It doesn't matter if you're really thirsty or thirsty. It's still the same. We can come to him and drink. We can come to him and drink. There's a, you go, I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. I probably mentioned a couple other times that in our family, there's, there's a rule. There's only one way into a pool. You know, that you don't daintily walk down the steps. That's not how you get into a pool. There's only one way in. Unless you're me. There's only one way into the pool. And, and that way is just to jump. And here's the irony. And two of our, there's only, there's only one, one child in the studio today. It's actually a metaphor for life. <laughs> they don't even realize the metaphor that I've been teaching them, that it's not about the pool. Mm -hmm. It's about sometimes the only way to start something is just by starting it. Yeah just by diving in. It's a metaphor. They don't get it yet. And whether or not they watch the video or not, whether or not, maybe one day they'll, they'll get it. They'll use the analogy. I'm like, yeah, you finally got it. It's, there's only one way into a pool. You just jump. You just jump. There's only one way to drink. You just drink. You just start. You just go. So what does that look like? What does that connection to him look like? There's a thousand ways. There's a thousand ways. And I, I'm, I'll list some off here, but please don't think these are exhaustive. Don't think you have to do these things. These are just examples of that connection. You know, it, it's, <laughs> it, it's worship. And what I mean by that is singing at the top of your lungs like nobody else is around. Whether they are around, I don't know. That's not the important part. But it's as if nobody else is around. It's singing at the top of your lungs like nobody else is around. It's crying in a conversation to God until there's no more tears left. That's connection. That's drinking. What else is it? It's shouting. It's shouting and talking to God and letting it all out. And what I mean, it's not like you have to shout to talk to God, but what I'm saying is some of you are at the price you're so deeply thirsty that you have to shout and get it out. That's what I mean by that. Sometimes it's just being quiet and still and not saying a word not bringing your agenda to god but letting god's agenda be communicated to you by your silence it's it's getting out all the frustration and anger and the absence of hope is it's, it's getting all that out getting out the fact that you are thirsty it's reading scripture until it reads you. It's reading scripture until it reads you. Meaning you read it until something speaks to you. Like that's it. That's the deal. It's talking with God until the weight of the situation you're telling him passes from you to him. It's talking with God until the weight of the situation passes from you to him. I was reading just this morning. Maybe I'll brought that up in when I was reading my devotional. I don't know. I was reading just this morning later in John. And Jesus is in the garden. He's praying. It was, it, was, it was the hours before his death and crucifixion. And he's praying because he doesn't, he's not fired up over about what's going to happen to him. As you know, you're familiar with it. He goes, Lord, he goes, Father, if there's any other way, mm -hmm. I'm in. But if not, I'll still go. But if there's any other way, let's go. And he's praying. He gets frustrated with the disciples because they keep falling asleep. And there's a whole interaction there. And then when he finally gets towards the end, it's been some hours. The uh, guards and the soldiers show up to arrest him. And they're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And they're like, is Jesus here? And, and Jesus, you know, he stands up and he looks at him and he goes, I am. And it says they fell back. 
And the interesting part about that, if you look at that, the words Jesus used, I am, as in the I am, as in Moses on the mountain saying, God, who, who will I say sent me? Tell them I am sent me. That's what Jesus threw. And they are, they are struck back by the power of God, I am. And you look at that story and you have to realize what happened in the prayer. The weight of what was going to be put upon Jesus had passed from him to the Father. And now he was quenched. His thirst was quenched. And he was ready to move in power. And he did. He goes, I am. The, and they're drawn back. Struck by the power of God. Because like, not only am I Jesus of Nazareth, I am. That's what, we ha- that's what we do when we talk with God and the weight of the matter passes from us to him. And then we're endued with power from on high. That's quenching thirst. And in all those things, we drink and we're connected to him. We're satisfied in him through his spirit. So question. So when you hear about these different ways of of meaningful time with Jesus, more than just your quick little, I read my five minute scripture and my two second prayer and I'm off to the, to work today. Um, How often do you spend these meaningful times with Jesus where you're dedicating a specific time to really work through or talk through process? Obviously it's depending on what situations are coming up, right? But I feel like this is something that we maybe neglect a little bit in our life. The quick ones are better than no ones. But a a longer focused time to really just be with him. We've talked about that being still and knowing that he's God. Um, So how often do you make time for that during your day, your week, um, that focused, connected time with him?
Verse 38. Jesus says, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. That word believes there um, has to do with putting a confidence in him. Has to do with putting confidence. Whoever puts confidence in Jesus out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And not only that, but I like to say it like this. It's water that's alive. It's water that's alive. That's water that gives life. Not just for you, but forever. Others. We all know what good water tastes like. And even though it's tasteless, we know what good water is. Some of us have even have our own favorite bottled waters. Like I do. I have, my, I have There is certain bottled water. I'm like, that is that tastes like sink water, right? Or there, or there's like you've left your water bottle sitting in your car for like four days, and then you go to drink some, and it's just not as tasty not as it used to be anymore. Right? We know what good water is, but Jesus, out of you will flow water that's alive, that's good, that's good water, and it's because the Holy Spirit is in you, because we're in partnership with Him. If you are a believer, the Holy Spirit is in you. Even though at times you feel that God may be afar off and you can't see his leading, no, he hasn't left. He hasn't forgotten you. He's with you and he's in you. So the question is, have we taken a drink? Have we taken a drink? The refrigerator's stocked. You got the filter on the the sink. You're good to go. It's iced. It's chilled It's good to go. Have we taken a drink? Have we set aside moments in our life to drink? Pastor Rosanna was just talking about this. Have we set aside extended time with him, with God? Extended time with God. Because some of us, we get, we're good at moments, having moments. I had this moment with God. I had this, I talked with him before I went into a meeting. I, I read a verse today. Great. Those are moments. Awesome. Moments keep you topped off. Moments is like carrying a water bottle. Like, oh, I'm no longer parched. Right? It, it, it's those moments. But we need extended time with him for a thorough filling from time to time. Mm-hmm. It's good to top off, but make sure the tank is really full. Make sure the tank's really full. It's, it's <clears throat> praying in the spirit, praying in our prayer language until the thirst is gone. That's how it works. It's taking moments to stop and drink, telling God, God, I need partnership. It's putting your headphones in at work. I know some of you can do that. Some of you can't do that. So use that wherever you, wherever you are. But it's putting your headphones in at work and listening to worship music when there's chaos all around you when a report's due. It's, it's, it's filling. It's the verse on your desk. It's the verse on your refrigerator. It's the verse on your bathroom mirror. His promises that are for you, that he spoke to you, for you, that's drinking. That's drinking. You know, um, I've done some races, long races, adventure races. You know, we run miles and miles and miles. And there's kind of a rule when you do these things. One of you have running races and whatnot. That there's a rule when you have that is when there's, there's tables of water. And the rule is this. If you aren't thirsty and there's water on the table, you drink. You just grab a cup. Maybe just a little sip, throw the cup, right? Or you pour it on your head. But you always take the water. And the reason why is you're not drinking because you're thirsty. You're drinking to prevent thirst. You're staying topped off. You're staying, staying topped off. You're preventing thirst. Remember that in this partnership, we have the Holy Spirit. That this water that flows out of us isn't just for us. It's for others. Others need him too. Others need what the Holy Spirit has given you. They need to know it too. 
whether that the Holy Spirit specifically gives you something for someone else. But here's the thing. If he does that, that's life for them that day. That's their moment. That's their drink. Because you're obedient to receive, because you're obedient to deliver, they get to drink. They get to drink. It, it's a word of hope on a hot summer's day. It's a drink. It's a message that gets relayed from God through you to them, and it changes them. Out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. Notice that he didn't say, out of you will become a giant pool that you get to swim in. It was out of you will flow a river of living water into other people. Rivers will flow out of you when we take a drink, when we spend time with him. Question. So here's a challenge for this week. I want you to pull out your calendars right now. I want you to take a look at your schedule. Do people have calendars? On your phone, oh. right? Your phone calendar. Day timer. Or your day timer. Unzip my day timer. Or your old school day timer. Or the little tiny paper calendar. Or the really big desk calendar. Whatever calendar you that have handy. That one you got from the real estate agent. Yeah. Whatever calendar you have handy that shows your schedule for this week. And I want you to pick a time, a place, and schedule time to have a meaningful moment with God. Whatever that thinks to you, like if you, if you struggle in a five minute connection with him, maybe schedule for 10 minutes. If you normally spend 30 minutes, maybe schedule 45 to an hour, right? Take what you're doing and challenge you, double it, right? And put that on your calendar in a time when you know you can fulfill that. And when that calendar alert goes off, Go spend some time with Jesus. And there will be a question about this next week about how this went. So put it on your calendar. Homework. Homework. Be prepared next week. We're going to discuss what this was like for you. Okay? So that is your challenge for this week. So they should right now. Right now. Pull your phone out. Oh. And should they talk about it when they put it down? Like to say, I'm going to do it on this day to give a They can, yeah. If they, if they feel like doing or that. should just be a moment friends, of silence where people A are moment like of tapping. silence on your phone. And then you guys can all like, okay. Or or maybe your community leader wants to like jot it all down and then send you a text reminder. Like your boss Ooh, might like, hey, your that's, project's that's due that's tomorrow. Extreme. But however you guys want to handle it. But just know it will be discussed next week. So schedule time to have a meaningful relationship moment with God.
On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, whoever puts their confidence in me, as the scripture has said, out of their heart will flow rivers of living water. Whatever state of thirst you're in, thirsty or real thirsty, come to him and drink. Get what you need from him. His spirit is in your life, believer. The Holy Spirit is in believer in a believer's life. He is in you. Ask for filling. Ask for flow. Ask for the river to flow. Ask for connection. Pour it all out to him and then receive all he has for you. And by doing that, you'll receive things for others. If we're thirsty, we know how to fix it. If you're real thirsty, you know how to fix it. Go to him. Let him quench your thirst. Let's pray. And Jesus, I can see you on that day, Lord, that you're standing up there. Does anyone come to me or is thirsty? Come to me and drink. Father, we're coming to you. We want to drink. As we take those moments and times and extended times this week, we drink. Father, but it's not just for us, it's for others as well. Whatever state of thirst we're in, quench that thirst. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your power. Fill us with all that you want us to do. Fill us with your promises, Lord not just for us, but for others. And those of us, Father, that might have not yet received the Holy Spirit, we say be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak out of prayer language in the name of Jesus. We ask and we receive. Amen.